All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Comp 3430 Operating Systems. I hope that you all had a good weekend. I hope that you all had a good weekend. Uh, it's really windy the last few days. It's been so windy. It's been so, so windy. We're uh, halfway through the course now. We're like officially, we passed that point of being halfway through the course. And um, we're kind of getting to the part of the course that I am the most excited about. Uh, my, my favorite part by far of this whole course is file systems. This is that's my absolute favorite part of this entire course is file systems. And the reason that I like file systems so much, just personally, the reason that I like file systems so much is that it is applied data structures, just purely applied data structures. That's all it is, is just taking data structures and representing information with data structures in a way that is like tangible. We can actually get stuff out of this thing that we've got. Before we get to file systems, though, uh, I want to spend a little bit of time taking a look at assignment two and lab two. So similar to lab one, what I want to do today is go just show you some code. I'm not going to publish it, but I'll show you some code, step through it, describe what's going on with it, how it's working. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about assignment two, the expectations for it, what you're being asked to do for the assignment. And then uh, time permitting, we'll talk about IO devices. There should be some time to talk about IO devices. But in terms of IO devices, I'm, I'm not personally too concerned about that topic. Uh, what I like to do with this part of the course with IO devices is spend more time um, looking at how it actually works on a real system as opposed to the kind of lower level details that we're getting from the textbook. So when we're looking at IO devices in class today, we'll be looking at it from the perspective of the Linux operating system and how the Linux operating system uh, exposes devices to us. So how device drivers kind of fit into the picture, but really what we're getting from the operating system as consumers of uh, devices and device drivers. So uh, what I want to do today, by the end of today's lecture, what you should be able to do, again, if we get to it, is describe how an operating system communicates with hardware devices. So this is mainly coming from our textbook in terms of this idea of layers and device drivers, how an operating system abstracts physical devices, how device drivers can be written for them, and then how communication happens between those things. Uh, and explain how an operating system provides abstraction around hardware devices. In terms of what we'd be looking at today, abstraction around hardware devices, the, the grand sum of it is the Linux and Unix operating systems make devices available as though they are files that we can just open and read and write and operate on using the APIs that we're already fairly comfortable with. The abstraction that the Linux and Unix operating systems are providing is just Everything's a file, everything is a file, and we interact with, with the same kinds of uh, approaches that we have um, with previous things. So with that, uh, I wanna spend some time taking a look at lab two. I wanna kinda quickly run through the lock implementation stuff, but the lock implementation stuff, I, I believe that was straightforward. I believe that was fairly straightforward to, to implement. There wasn't really a lot going on with that. You were scaffolded with a lot of code and you were just kind of filling in some of the, the details, but let's take a look at it anyway. So with uh, the part that you're doing for uh, locks with lab two, labs, lab two, guide, lock maybe, with this, you're kind of asked to implement a few different solutions for locking mechanisms and then make observations about them. See that they work or don't work and what kinds of behaviors they have in terms of making system calls. The first one that you're asked to implement, so this is kind of the general structure that you're given, these functions mutex lock and unlock, an object that you're using to lock and unlock and then what you're actually going to lock the critical section here, this is a bad implementation of the lock of the critical section, but it allows concurrency to happen. I don't know why this is here. And I'm constantly like banging into it. I'm gonna put it here. 
try to make it so that it doesn't just fall over randomly in the class. The implementation of like the lock of the critical section is not performant. It is correct, but it is not performant. But it's allowing us to illustrate the idea that we're trying to implement. So this is counting up to something that's really high, and it should be doubling that. We've got two threads of execution that are running. In this one, we're asked to do just a pure spin lock. And this is really just testing to see if the lock has been set or not and setting it, but doing it non-atomically. It doesn't work. Good. We're good. This doesn't work. La the next one that we were looking at was atomic spin. An atomic spin, with this one, what we were looking for was the idea that rather than having just an integer lock, we would use this language feature of C to give us access to atomic variables and use that atomic variable in place of the lock integer itself, and then use that as the locking structure for our spin lock. So to declare an integer as atomic in C, like the current version of C that we're using, we use this underscore atomic, or you can use any of the things from STD atomic that you uh, could see in that, in that document that I linked to. And we use it, we're still using it as a spin lock, and we can see that we're testing it repeatedly in a while loop and setting it separately. It's an atomic variable, but we're not doing atomic operations. So the, because we're not doing this as a single atomic operation, despite this being an atomic variable, the modification that we're making across two separate statements is not going to be atomically applied. So that also doesn't work. The lock maybe is my implementation of actually using the atomic primitives that are given to us by STD atomic. So using that atomic flag type, uh, setting an atomic flag variable as opposed to using just a basic integer, and then in the lock implementation, using that atomic flag test and set function. So now we're kind of down to one single line as opposed to having two separate things. And this one actually works. This one actually works where we test and set as a single atomic operation as opposed to two separate operations, even if we were using atomic variables. This one works. So if I run these, uh, pure spin doesn't really work. We get something that's nowhere near twice the value that we were supposed to get. Atomic spin does a little bit better but it's still not correct because we still have these operations as two separate operations. They're not being implemented as a single atomic operation. And lock maybe actually works. It actually, actually works. We get the sum that we're expecting to get because it's using atomic modifications to do the locking itself. Is that okay? That one was okay. I think it was okay. Kyle has already graded this, and he, we got him back. So I hope that, that the feedback you're getting from Kyle is, is looking good. The other half of this was uh, to take what you've got and implement it again, but with pthread mutex lock. So just replace the lock call to pthread mutex lock and unlock instead of using the mutex lock and unlock that we declared for you. And the question here was, how do the system calls change or do the system calls change? So how does pthreads as an implementation start to interact with our operating system as opposed to the, what we have just done with these atomic primitives? Uh, the way that we answer this question is to say s trace, And then, so this is that program that does system call tracing. So it prints out the list of system calls that are being made by a program. S trace dash f dash f will follow. So this says any child processes that get created, I should also follow those child processes and print out system calls that they are making as opposed to just doing what my main process is doing right now. And so if I run s trace dash f on lock maybe, there is a bunch of stuff here. And then we kind of get this block that happens. It just kind of sits here for a little while, and then we finish. 
And then there's not really much else. We get this write system call, it prints out what we were expecting to get at the bottom, and there's not really much going on in terms of system calls here. Atomic test and set is not a system call. This is generating an instruction. This is generating like that Intel compare and exchange instruction, which is not a, a privileged instruction. This is just something that any code is allowed to run if it wants to. If we do the same thing with the pthread implementation, what we're going to see is this. So I, I'm going to run it again just to make sure that you see what's happening here. Compared to lock maybe, so I'll run this one more time. This just kind of prints out some stuff, stops for a little while while it's doing its thing, and then prints out a little bit more. The pthread lock one is constantly calling this function futex. Futex is a locking mechanism that's provided by the Linux kernel. So pthread mutex locks, these are user space threads. They're kind of, they're supposed to be ex executing within the context of your address space. They're working within the user space. They're making a bunch of system calls where the code that we've written is not making any system calls. So we're using just these primitive things. Futex is being used by pthread mutex lock. This is just an implementation detail of these two things. What I'm, what I'm also interested in, what I'm, what I'm interested in, is also to see how fast and how performant these things are compared to each other. So how does my test and set implementation work compared to pthread mutex lock? Like, I, I spent 30 minutes or less working on this thing compared to the people that are doing pthreads that have spent literally decades building this thing up. How does it actually compare? So I tried to run this through Hyperfine to see approximately what the difference is between uh, my implementation and the pthreads implementation is. And I'll run it for you here. And with 10 runs, it's faster, but like not twice as fast. Not twice as fast. And it's like plus or minus 0.13. So I'd say we're within like error bars of the pthreads implementation. One thing that I'd like to point out here is to build upon what we saw with strace. With the pthread lock implementation, we've got about 700 milliseconds or 800 milliseconds spent in user space. This is the code that our process has. This is what's running in our code. And then it's spending about 670, 700 milliseconds in system space. This is where it's blocked waiting on locks with that futex system call. It's making that futex system call and it's trying to acquire locks and getting stuck. With lock maybe, with the atomic primitives, we're spending 1800 milliseconds in user space. So test and set, this is an instruction that's running in our code. That test and set is happening entirely in our code and the system time here is 1.8 milliseconds. So they're about the same in terms of performance, but the difference that we can see here is that we're spending way more time in our own code as opposed to switching back and forth constantly. We're not doing a lot of mode and context switching back and forth with the operating system um, with the primitives that we were using, the atomic primitives that we were using. OK with that? Yeah, OK. Like I said, this one I, I, th I think was OK. I think it's like less interesting in terms of like me spending a lot of time talking about it. But it, I thought it was interesting to just try this stuff out and see how to build a lock ourselves. The other half of this is uh, what's called what's called here as hot potato. I'm going to open this code up. This is an exercise where you are doing what is effectively a producer and consumer problem. What's effectively a producer and consumer problem. The summary of it is you're getting input on standard inputs, and then you pass that work off to somebody else and then you immediately start getting work on standard input again while that other person is doing the work that they're trying to do. They do their work, they pass it off to the next person, and then they immediately start trying to do their work while that other person is trying to do their work, all kind of concurrently at the same time. 
We're taking data from standard input, pushing it to the next, getting more data on standard input, pushing it to the next, getting more data on standard input, pushing it to the next. And we're kind of pumping this stuff through. We're got, we've got producers and consumers that are doing this. This is an exercise that's trying to get you to use uh, condition variables to signal to the workers that are kind of further down the production line here that there's data available for them to work on. Let's take a look at this. Let's take a look at this code. Uh, first of all, uh, to be clear about the providence of this code, this is Rob's code. This is not my code. This is Rob's code. Um, and so when I think about Rob writing code, I don't usually think about him writing this, this approach. What I kind of uh, imagine Rob doing when he's writing code is spending time writing code that looks more like this than what we saw before. The terminal only supports monospace fonts. I want to spend some time stepping through this. I, I thought this was a funny joke, uh, but I can't actually bear to, to, to do the rest of this in this font, so I'm going to switch it back. <laughs> that makes it so much more readable. Yeah. Uh, I can't tell if you're joking or not. not joking. I'm not joking. Okay. Okay. All right. I am going to. We are not going to be using windings and webdings to do this because uh, I definitely couldn't do it with that. But I can do it in here, and I'm going to just grit my teeth and do it the whole time. Okay. I'm going to, I, I want to take the time to draw pictures. I want to take the time to draw pictures for this so that we can see what's happening with these threads of execution while they are running through, not just step through the code and shout at you about what's happening, but actually spend some time thinking about what's going on here. I'm going to start by stepping through the code and shouting at you about what's going on, but I do want to draw a picture to kind of see how things are getting stuck in certain places, what the threads are all doing at different points. So on line 90 there, we're declaring two p threads. We're initializing two condition variables. We're creating these two p threads by calling p thread create. We're telling them to run these stage one and stage two functions. And then we, in the main thread of execution, immediately start to get input on standard input. So the very first thing that we're doing after we declare this buffer on 104 is get input on standard input and then loop. So we'll keep on getting stuff on standard input. Once we've got something on standard input, print out a summary of what it is, get a lock on a buffer. The buffer that we are getting a lock on here is shared between the main thread of execution and the first thread of execution. So main's got its own buffer as a stack variable, but it's also got this first buffer, and this is shared between the main thread and thread one, which is running stage one. Then what we do is we're setting a variable that's called signal to one. What we're saying is, there is data available for you to consume. We're setting a flag that says this. And then we're sending the signal that says, wake up, please. There's work for you to do. Please work on it. Unlock the lock. So lock it, copy to buffer, set a flag, send the signal, unlock the lock so that the worker can actually start doing something with the data. Once we've done that, get more input. Notify that there's work available. Immediately start waiting for more input on standard input. So concurrently, the thread that's waiting on buffer one, first buffer, is waking up while I am also at the same time starting to get more work on standard input. Let's go up. Single to the worker. Stage one here. is our lowercase thread. And stage one has a stack allocated buffer. 
It's got an infinite loop here. And then here is where we're setting up this wait. So before we can wait on the condition, we lock it. We're testing to see if this flag is set. We're waiting on this lock condition. So why is Rob, why does Rob have this loop here? Why does he have this loop? Why do we have a loop around this pthreadcon wait? pthreadcon wait on Linux systems, this is referred to in our textbook. They've got a link to the manual pages for the pthreads implementation on Linux, the Linux specific pthreadcon wait manual page. There are circumstances where pthreadcon wait can wake up kind of randomly, kind of randomly, like you're not expecting it to wake up, but your thread wakes up and it gets the lock. And it might be a situation where it wakes up, but there isn't actually data for it to consume. So the flag that we set in the main thread of execution, we're testing that here around this pthread con wait to make sure that there's actually data for us to consume after we've waked, woken up, waked up, woken up. When this thread starts, it blocks on pthread con wait. So it's stuck there waiting around until my main thread of execution sends the signal, please wake up, there's data for you to consume. Once it wakes up, this flag is set. We set the flag back to false. This thread has the lock. This flag is only being set in places where there's a lock that's held. So the main thread is only setting it inside of a lock. This thread of execution that's doing lowercase is setting it only inside of a lock. We copy data from first buffer into my copy. So we're taking this shared buffer between the main thread and the first thread, and we're copying data into our own local buffer. And then we are unlocking the lock. So we're allowing the other thread, the main thread, to start doing stuff with this buffer again. Once we have a local copy of it, then we start iterating through and printing out. These are all the lowercase characters that happen to be in this buffer that I have just started working on. Once I finish printing out my work, I do the same sort of thing as what the main thread of execution did. I lock the second shared buffer that's between thread lowercase and thread uppercase, copy the data into it, signal, set that flag, signal to that thread that it's uh, available for work to do, unlock the lock, and then go back up to my own beginning of loop and start waiting for that signal to be sent by the main thread of execution. The other one does exactly the same thing, exactly the same thing, the same sort of structure. We've got a shared buffer. We're copying from the shared buffer into our stack allocated variable. We're testing to see if that flag has been set. We're testing, uh, printing out stuff based on whether or not it's an uppercase. And then we are exiting at that point. There's no further things in this chain of work to do. So when I run this, in my terminal that looks just crazy, when I run this, it's waiting uh, on input right now. It's stuck on standard input, waiting for me to type something in. We send stuff out. And then we're stuck waiting on standard input again. I'm going to draw a picture. I want to draw some pictures to step through the flow of what's happening here. So I'm going to uh, kill this, Control C. I'm going to kill this. I'm going to put Visual Studio, Visual, Studio, Visual Studio Code to my side here. And I'm going to pop up my um, tablet. And I'm going to. Uh, Collapse the Explorer. The font is big enough to see OK at the back. Yes, OK. So I'm going to start this out. I'm going to call this my timeline. And I'm going to start at time 0. This is going to be on my x-axis here. And time just goes up. 
I'm not gonna be doing like, you know, cycle accurate simulation of what's happening here, but approximately what's going on um, starting at time zero. So at time zero, our main thread of execution starts. At time zero, our main thread of execution starts, and it's running here in our main function. We're initializing these two uh, condition variables, the signals that we're using to send between the threads of execution. And then a little bit later, we're starting these two workers. So I'm going to say main starts, worker one starts, and then worker two starts just a little bit after that. I'm going to try to write a little bit slower so I'm not just complete chicken scratch. Worker one starts and worker two starts. All three of these threads are executing concurrently. They're all running something at the same time right now. I'm going to pick one randomly. So I'm, I'm the scheduler here. I'm just going to make a decision about which one gets to go next. And I'm going to say that worker one is going to start. That's the first thing that's going to get to go in this whole system. Worker one is running stage one. And the very first thing that it does in stage one is lock lock one. So worker one starts. I'm going to say that it acquires lock number one here. It tests to see what signal to one is, which right now is false. So it has been set to false initially. It's false. And then it goes into sleep, waiting on p thread cond wait. p thread p t h r c n d wait. It calls p thread cond wait and goes to sleep. It suspends itself. Unlike our lock, where we've got spin lock. With the, even with atomic operation test and set spin lock, where it's doing something the whole time it's waiting for the lock, p thread cond wait literally says go to sleep and don't be rescheduled until you actually have been signaled to wake up. So at this point, worker one goes to sleep. I'm the scheduler. I'm going to say that the main thread of execution wakes up. It wakes up. The main thread of execution is running code in our main function. And we suspended this just after we created these two threads of execution. It's going to wake up. And it will immediately ask for input on standard input, get input. get input on std in, and then block. So it's stuck. It's waiting for us to type something in right now. That kind of means that thread one, th the main thread of execution, and thread one, worker one now, are both suspended. They're waiting for something to happen. They're not doing anything anymore. So worker two is going to start. Worker two is running in stage two here, and it does the same thing as what worker one was doing, but with a different lock. It's locking lock two, and it's waiting on signal two. So after this uh, main thread of execution is run, worker two locks lock number two. It does that p thread cond wait. And then it goes to sleep. So both worker one and worker two right now are suspended. They're not doing anything. I'm going to type on my keyboard in the main thread of execution, and I'm going to hit the Enter key. And so 
the main thread of execution unblocks. So I'll type in keyboard input H E L L O, hello. So one uppercase letter and then four lowercase letters after it. We unblock and we enter this loop. We print out working on hello. We lock lock one. So when p thread cont wait is run in worker one here, we're unlocking that lock. We release it. So thread one doesn't hold it right now. It's not holding on to that lock right now. I'm going to go back here and I'm going to annotate this again and apologize for not doing that when I, when I meant to. Thread one unlocks lock one. It releases lock one here. Similarly, uh, thread two also releases lock two. Once it goes to sleep, it gives up access to the lock that we've got there. So the main thread of execution acquires lock one. And it copies from the stack buffer that the main thread has into the buffer that's shared between thread one and thread two. So it's going to copy hello into a buffer that's shared by the worker one. This is part of our critical section that's between these two threads of execution. It's safe because we have locked the lock that is prohibiting other access to this first buffer. We change signal to one to true. We send the signal. So I'm going to say here notify. When I'm saying notify, just to be clear, the send signal. I'm sending the signal, p thread con signal, p t h r c n d sig. I'm notifying thread one. And I've, we've chosen to use p thread cont signal here instead of p thread cont broadcast because we know that there's only one thread waiting. There's only one thread waiting, so we don't need to use p thread, p -thread cont broadcast. I notify worker one by, by sending a signal, and then I unlock lock one. Unlock lock one. I'm going to say I'm the scheduler here again. The main thread of execution finishes, and it's blocked again on getting input on standard, standard input. So block get input on STDN and block. And then we're, we're suspended. We're just sitting here, chilling out, waiting around for somebody to type something in on the keyboard. I'm going to say that thread two gets to go. Thread two is still conned wait. It's not going to get scheduled. Nothing's going to happen. It will just continue to wait around in that, in that block. So then we can return to thread one. I'm going to scroll up to stage one. Thread one was blocked here, but now it's going to wake up and it will immediately have lock one. So we don't reacquire it. We don't write pthread mutex lock anywhere, but the condition wait, cont wait, when we are awoken, when we return from that, once we wake up, we have the lock again. So the main thread has unlocked it. That means that we now have access to the lock. We have it. We hold it right now in thread one. Thread one is holding on to the lock. It tests to see a signal to one true. It is, so we exit the loop. 
We set this to false. That's part of our critical section. It's safe to, for us to set that to false because the main thread is not going to be running it right now. It's locked out of that critical section. I copy data from first buffer into my buffer, my copy. I'm going to copy for the data from here into my copy. And then I'm going to unlock the lock. And then I am going to get suspended, and the main thread will get to go again. And the main thread is waiting for me to type something in. And I'm going to say, OK, it's going to be keyboard world. It's going to do approximately the same thing as what we had done with hello here. So I type something in. It's going to try to acquire the lock. And it will be able to because thread one unlocked it before it was suspended. And just to make things go a little bit faster, I'm going to copy this block here. So we acquire lock one. We're not copying hello, but we're copying world to first buffer, signal to one to true again, notify worker one, pthread con sig, and then unlock lock one. Thread one's going to take over again. Thread one is going to take over. It is unlocked, but it hasn't printed anything out yet. So now it's going to start printing stuff out. It has not waited on the signal, even though the main thread of execution has sent the signal to us. We haven't waited for anything yet. The main thread sent it. We're starting to print stuff out. We're working from our local copy of this. So we're going to print out just the lowercase letters. So std out will get e l l o. And then new line character. Thread one will then lock lock two and do the same thing that thread the main thread of execution was doing for us. Copy it into the shared buffer for buffer two for uh, for thread two. So we acquire lock two. We're copying hello. to second buffer over here. Signaling to two. Is true. And then we notify worker two. By sending it a signal with the second condition variable that we've got. Once we finish that, we unlock our lock. And we go back to testing to see if we have data that's been sent to us. In this case, once we unlock this lock, we're going to go back up to the top of our loop here, infinite loop. We're immediately going to try and lock lock one. We will succeed because the main thread of execution unlocked it before it was suspended. We're going to lock lock one. We're going to test to see is signal to one set. And it is just before or just after the main thread of execution finished copying into first buffer. Signal to one was set. So we never go to sleep waiting on a signal. We don't even bother sleeping on waiting on a signal because that flag was already set to say there's data for you to consume. So we don't have to try waiting around for a signal to be sent to us. 
We skip p thread cond wait and we just set signal to one as false. Copy first buffer back into our buffer here. Unlock the lock. And proceed. So start printing out what we've got. Worker two at this point can wake up and it can do the same kinds of things that worker one is doing. So it's the same general structure where we're waiting on that, that signal to be sent to us. Worker one has sent the signal. Here, worker two will be able to wake up from that sleep. It's not suspended anymore. Test the flag. It will proceed past that critical section after copying the buffer into its own local copy produce outputs, and then worker two kind of just terminates at that point or repeats the loop again, waiting for more, waiting for more inputs. I'm going to stop. Yeah. This is happening at time after zero. So time is increasing. This is time zero. One, two, Theory dot dot dot. Sorry, I, I meant to make that clear. We're just increasing time constantly as we're going down. F gets here is just reading however many characters we've asked it to read. So it's not reading word by word. It's it's just reading as many characters as it can up until that size. Or we've hit enter and it's read less than that. So it might read less than the number of characters that we've asked it to read. But worker one is waiting for stuff to happen. And it's waiting for stuff to happen on this p thread cond wait. So as soon as we call this in stage one, let me scroll up to stage one here. As soon as we call this in stage one, we're suspended. The main thread of execution is waiting for us to actually start typing something in. And so the second thread can't do anything until we have something to work on. Once there's something to work on, the main thread notifies the other thread. It says, hey, there's work for you to do. I've copied it into this buffer that we share. Wake up, and when you get a chance, start working on that, please. Yeah. What happens if we don't have an infinite loop? So our workers then, the question, just to summarize, to make sure I understand, the question is, what if we don't have this? Is that right? Yeah. If we don't have that, we would just do one input and then exit. So the thread would work on hello and then immediately terminate. It would notify worker two that there is work for it to do, but it would just then terminate. And then the main thread would continue to wait on standard input, and we would keep typing stuff in, but there's no more workers waiting around for it to, to signal anymore. It would send signals, and nobody would be listening. Can you put the p thread create in a while loop? You, you could, and it might approximate the same kind of output as what we're showing here, but the goal for this is to try and get these three threads to be running concurrently. So these are three threads that just stick around forever until they're told to terminate, as opposed to finishing as soon as they've done the work that they are uh, told to work on. That's fair. Yeah, you could definitely get the same output if you have like create, get input, create a thread for that input, get more input, create another thread for that input, get more input, create another thread for that input. The one problem with that solution is if I have a source of data that's not just me typing at my keyboard, I can only type so fast. I can only press enter so fast. But a hard drive or a network stream can produce data as fast as it can go, like many gigabits per second. 
And if you're creating a new thread for every 50 bytes or whatever, you're going to wind up with millions and millions of threads very quickly. And then your program will crash. Can, can you repeat the question, please? Sorry, I couldn't hear you over the door closing. So the thread after it's done, it yeah. be immediately in, like, removed or? Yeah, so as the threads exit, they would get their thread control block would get taken off of the process control block. That's, tr that's true, but the data could still be coming so fast that they wouldn't be able to finish before more threads were created and added to this process. So eventually you're going to get into a state where you're not even able to create any more threads because the 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 operating system is saying no, you, you can't make any more threads. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. The first block was the second copy. Yes. So there is uh there are three threads of execution here. There is a local buffer here. I'm going to call this BLM. This is the local to main buffer. There's buffer uh, BL1. This is the buffer that's local to worker one. There's BL2. This is the buffer that's local to worker two. But there's also buffers that are shared between BSM1 and BS1. Uh, Two. There are buffers that are shared between those threads of execution for them to communicate with each other. Could so could you copy directly from here to both of them at the same time? Sure, sure. That would be another way to approach the problem. It would be possible, yeah. We okay? Okay. This approach, I'm going to go back to the diagram that I've got here. There's one problem with this approach still. And the one problem with this approach is that the workers don't tell the main thread of execution that they have actually worked on the data that they've worked on. The main thread of execution, as long as it's able to get the lock, will just get the lock and copy stuff into the buffer that's shared between these two threads of execution. The worker in stage one here has the lock in between this block here, where it's waiting for the signal and where it's copied the data to its local buffer, it holds the lock. If the worker is suspended here, so outside of the, the critical section, if I'm suspended there, the main thread could go through this entire block two times or more, two times or more. I'd have to be fast. I'd have to be really, really fast, but the main thread could go through this multiple times. Get input, copy to the first buffer, signal to one true, notify the worker, immediately get more input, get the lock, copy to first buffer, signal to one is true, notify worker, and then get suspended. The worker thread doesn't really know anything about that first thing that was overwritten because it's busy still trying to work on the data that it had at that moment. So it's still busy trying to work on this thing. The problem with this right now is that we can get into states where we lose data because our worker thread doesn't say, I'm finished with it. It's OK for you to send me more data. 
The way that we would want to change this to fix that issue is down here, where in this copy into my copy, we send a signal back to the, to the caller, to the, the source of information for us, back to the main thread that says, I've consumed the data. Set a flag, send a signal. I've consumed the data. It's OK for you to copy into the buffer and then prevent the main thread from copying over the buffer until that's happened. So waiting around until that's happened. The main issue is, yeah, we can lose data because we can go through this entire cycle multiple times while the other thread is just doing something else, busy doing something else. Yeah, so if we did that, we would need to have it set up like a full backwards chain. Worker 2 needs to signal to worker 1. Worker 1 needs to signal to the main thread of execution. Yeah, yeah. All right. We are good. I hope we are good. OK. The main purpose of this lab was to give you the opportunity to practice using condition variables. And the main purpose of this lab was to get you started for assignment two. Assignment two is a combination of scheduling and threads. It's a combination of scheduling and threads. And the things that you're being assessed on in this assignment are writing code that uses threads, writing code that uses pthread mutex lock, using condition variables, identifying critical sections, evaluating the performance of scheduling policies, and writing Unix programs to implement scheduling policies. You're also, like I said, implicitly being assessed on the deadlock uh, uh, learning outcome for this because you are going to be writing code that uses multiple locks that can get into deadlock situations. Uh, and that is kind of an, an implicit assessment. I'm not uh, really assessing you on your ability to do deadlocks or to identify and fix deadlocks, but you're going to probably run into deadlocks when you're writing code um, to solve this problem. I'm going to skip over the general submission requirements here because they are the same other than to note that uh, this is something that should be fast. This simulator should still be fast. All the stuff that you're doing in this simulator is in microseconds. Microseconds are a very small unit of time, a very, very small unit of time. Your code should not take more than a few seconds to run through this entire simulation that you're going to be building up. You're going to be building a simulator that implements uh, the multi-level feedback queue scheduling policy. And the thing that you're simulating is not just implement the multi-level feedback queue scheduling policy, but implement it and see how it behaves on varying numbers of CPUs. This is a producer-consumer problem. This is a producer-consumer problem. The, the CPUs that you are going to be implementing are threads. You will have long running threads that are picking up tasks that have been scheduled by a scheduling policy. This is a high level recommended architecture for what you're implementing. You don't have to do it this way if you don't want to, but this is a recommendation for how you could do this. The general idea is that you will be given a set of tasks. The tasks will be in the form of a text file. So you're not going to be implement, you're not implementing CPU simulators. That's a different course. That is a different course. That is Comp 3370, depending on your instructor. Depending on your instructor. Some instructors don't require you to implement CPU simulators and others do. And I don't need to say anything more about that. You are implementing just something that takes tasks from a text file. I will describe the tasks later. Loading those tasks into the scheduling policy, into your scheduler. Your scheduler notifies 
the CPUs that there is work for them to do, and the CPUs will take tasks off of the scheduler. So we've got the scheduling policy that is just MLFQ. The dispatcher is the notification that there's work available. You have N CPUs that will do tasks when they are able to do tasks. The CPUs are responsible for doing things like accounting. So when we were doing that, you know, sticky notes, we we're doing the accounting. When does this start? When's the first time it got on a CPU? How long did it take? How much work has it been able to do? The CPUs are responsible for that and making decisions about where the task goes. So if it's finished, it goes into the finished area. If it's eligible to be rescheduled, there's still work left in this thing to do. It goes back into the scheduling policy. And it's the scheduling policy's job again to decide which job gets to go next. The workload is a text file. It's a plain text file. And the plain text file is generated by a Python program. The Python program is called taskmaker.py. It's in the same folder as this assignment. You should download this program and run it and generate more workloads. You have been given a workload, but you can generate more workloads. And you should, you should please, please generate more workloads to make sure that your program works with other uh, workloads. Generally, the tasks consist of four different parts. The name of the task, which is it's just a name. It's nothing special to uh, affect the way that the system works. There's a task type. This is just for accounting. And it's going to be later used for, uh, uh, it's just for accounting. It's just for accounting. There's the task length. How long does this task take in microseconds? So you're not actually doing any real work here. Your CPUs will just go to sleep. They will just sleep for the specified number of microseconds. That's the work that they will do, as opposed to actually you know, spinning in a busy loop or something. Odds of IO, this is going to be something that says, how likely is it that this task will yield the processor before the time slice has been elapsed? So yielding the processor here is saying, I would like to do a read system call, please. I need to give up the CPU because the operating system has to take over. So I'm not going to use my whole time slice. I'm going to give up, and somebody else will be able to get access to the CPU. Your odds of I.O. here are random number generators. You're using a random number generator to decide how likely it is that the task will do I.O. And then you're using a random number generator to decide how long the task runs before it does I.O. So you make two decisions with random numbers. One is, does it do I.O. at all? And then how long does it run before it does I.O.? Here's an example. This comes from taskmaker.py. This is a task that is named IO task one. This is not used anywhere except to just have a name. It's not actually used anywhere. Task type is three. Task type three is only used for accounting purposes later. So this is you going to be reporting how long this kind of task took, but you're not actually using this when you're running the tasks themselves. The task length, how, this has 100 microseconds left to complete, and the odds of I.O. is 50%. Half the time, this will do I.O. The other half of the time, it won't do I.O. Generate a random number between 1 and 0. Yeah, 0 and 1. Random floating point number between 0 and 1. If it's greater than 50%, if it's greater than half, then it does I.O. If it's less than half, it doesn't do I.O. That's the general idea here. You have a file that is provided to you. The graders will not be using that file to run your program. What I am asking you to do is generate at least one more tasks file from taskgenerator.py, taskmaker.py, and include that in your submission, one that you know works, one that you know works. Include that in your submission, and the graders may use this file for their assessment of your work to make sure that it runs. Odds of I.O. here, 
we're basically summarizing if you have 50% IO, make a decision, does this do IO or not? And once you have made the decision, does it do IO or not? If it is going to do IO, the random number that you generate then is going to be between zero, the length of a time slice, up to how much time the task has left. So like if you generate a number that's bigger than what the task has left, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. It doesn't make a lot of sense. So generate something up to the length of a time slice or the length of the, the job. IO is not something you're simulating. IO is something that just happens instantly. So if there's one task in the system and it does IO, it goes back into the scheduling policy and the scheduling policy just says, this is the next task and it just starts running again. It doesn't have to wait for IO to complete. It's not actually sitting around waiting for us to type something on the keyboard. We're just trying to simulate, does it go off the queue? Does it yield its time slice? We're also trying to simulate something that's sort of realistic. In the input file, you're gonna have these delay lines. And the delay lines say, here's a bunch of tasks, now stop. Your simulator should run. I'll come to you in just a second. Your simulator will load these tasks, start running the policy, and then wait, and then add more tasks as time is going on. So while the simulator is running, you are waiting around and then beginning to insert more tasks into the, the simulator itself. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so when it, no, it, it doesn't do anything. So it will, it will go to sleep for the length of time that it does before the IO happens. Yeah. But then once the, once the system call is made, it goes back into the scheduler and the scheduler may just put it back on immediately. Like it finished Im Im instantly. There was no waiting around for any IO to actually happen. The, so this, I guess to clarify, the sleeping is the, the work that the task is doing. So it goes to sleep to do work. Then it's like, I need to do a system call. I'm doing IO. So I'm going to just yield. I would like to be taken off of this processor, please. The processor then says, OK, you go back to the scheduling policy. The scheduling policy may just say, we're already done. You start right away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, it's like the IO has like, Can you repeat the question, please? Like if, like if, like the, um, like the IO, like has to be like where it like 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 a hundred milliseconds of work. Yeah. And like the time slice is also like hundred milliseconds. Would it do that work before it like checks if it's like about fifty percent or fifty percent? You would you would ask before you start doing the task. So because the task is you suspending, like going to sleep for that amount of time, you have to make the decision about whether or not you're doing IO before you go to sleep. So the, the order of operations is the CPU picks up the task. It decides, will it do IO or not, based on the odds that you've got in the task. If it does IO, it decides how long it will run before the IO happens. And then it will do that. Then it will go to sleep for either the full time slice, it didn't do any IO, or it will go to sleep for the amount of time that the random number was generated that was before the IO happens. To go to sleep, so let me scroll down just a second. Maybe this will answer your question. Maybe this will answer your question. And I will come back and make sure. The going to sleep is the work. So your, your task doesn't do work. It just sleeps for 300 microseconds or, or whatever the amount of time is that it's supposed to work for. So if you did IO, you pull this task off of the CPU, off of the scheduler. The scheduler says, hey, there's a task for you to do. The CPU picks it up. And then the CPU will say, does this one do IO? If the answer is no, then it just runs for the whole time slice. It goes to sleep for the whole time slice. If the answer is yes, this does IO, then another random number is generated. And the random number that gets generated is how long it works for, goes to sleep for, before it calls read or open or whatever the IO operation happened to be. Then it will go to sleep for that amount of time and then wake up 
and then go back into the scheduling policy. So the, the run order that's generated is, is, is not for like how long the IO is for, it's for how long it should be working. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Okay, good. Uh, it's given a little bit lower down in the document here. So this is the code that you can use for running tasks. You can just copy this code, no problem. That's totally fine. There is a use sleep function that you can also use if you would prefer to use that instead of my code. It's up to you. Make a decision about what you'd like to do. The scheduling policy that you're implementing is MLFQ at the end of the discussion of MLFQ, which is uh, this set of five rules. The values that you are given for configuration here is that you are going to have four priority levels. So four queues, four levels of priority for the tasks that are loaded into your system. The quantum length for all of the queues, it's consistent across all queues, is 50 milliseconds. So that's the time slice. The time allotment before priority low is lowered is 200 microseconds. And then a time value of S, this is going to be given to you um, later on in the part where we're asking you to do an analysis on your implementation. Uh, that's how long before you move everybody back up to the top again. So you're pushing people down, you're pushing tasks down, and then after a certain amount of time, you push everybody back up to the top again, and they're all top priority again. In terms of your queue data structure, you are more than welcome to make your own. You're also more than welcome to use these libraries or other libraries that you find. Although I will be honest with you, it may be just easier to make your own than it is to just try and use these existing libraries. I bring these to your attention because they exist. You're welcome to use them, but it, it may be easier to just build your own uh, queue library as opposed to um, implementing it this way. In terms of measuring time, uh, there's a link here uh, that uses something called clock get time. Because we're not measuring how long the whole system takes, but we're measuring how long different tasks take overall, um, you can use clock get time. And there's some code in this blog post, again, that you are explicitly permitted to copy if you want to copy it um, that's on that link. In terms of running, uh, what you're going to be implementing, you should have uh, the number of CPUs that are in the system. So this is, should be variable. We should be able to change the number of CPUs that are currently running in the system. How long the tasks should be in the system before they're moved up to the top priority again, and then the, the value, the file name that has all of the tasks in it. And for your output, what you're producing is the average turnaround time and response time for each type of task. This is where those uh, different types of tasks come in. In terms of the reports, I'm asking you to run this a bunch of times. So write the code and then run it a bunch of times using different values for S and different values for the number of CPUs to see how those things affect your output. Yeah. Will S always be a multiple of 50? Those are the values, so yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, if you want to write tables in Markdown, um, there are plugins for your editor that can help you with that. Please don't just manually try to do this spacing and stuff, because that's not a fun time for anybody. Uh, I use Vim table mode, uh, but I realize that not everybody uses Vim. I may be the only person in this room that still uses Vim. Does anybody else use Vim? One person does, thank you, good. So there's Vim table mode, please use that. It's really nice, uh, you can use backslash TM to switch into table mode and it does auto spacing and stuff for you, it's great. In terms of evaluation, uh, code quality and design are part of it. The implementation of the multi-level feedback queue, I wanna make sure that I'm pointing at this specifically. The implementation of multi-level feedback queue can be not multi-threaded. You are more than welcome to not do multi-threaded and no CPUs, just have one CPU and just do MLFQ. You will be graded at that level, kind of the one to four level. If it works perfectly with exactly one CPU and no threads, you can get four out of 10 for, for the implementation. I know that's not ideal, but just to, to give you a sense of how to build this up. Once you have got that one CPU working, then try to start building this up as a multi-threaded implementation, having more than one CPU that's pulling things off of the, the, the scheduling policy. 
and then making sure that you're able to read specifically about delaying here. So being able to delay the loading of tasks as they are being loaded into the system. And then the, the final thing is that everything is, is fully complete. And the report here is worth five points. So um, making sure that once you've got your implementation, you're able to generate the report. I think that's it. Uh, other than to say that microseconds are microseconds and it should be fast. A hundred tasks that run for just hundreds of microseconds each, that's not even a second if you load the whole thing up. Not even an entire full clock time second. It should be very fast to run your simulator. Yeah. Everything that we have done so far in this course should be done for this assignment. So we're not going to do any more about condition variables or anything. We're not going to do scheduling anymore. Uh, not process or task scheduling anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. They arrive, I mean, you, 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 they, they arrive at the same time in the sense that they're arriving like as fast as you can load the file, yes. And we're measuring real time here. So, I mean, we're talking about tiny fractions of a second between tasks, but so yeah, they, they approximately arrive at the same time, yes. Yeah. But the amount of time that it's like between task one and task two for loading in after your delay line, we're not talking a lot about uh, talking much about time. They're not going to affect the output of what you're getting from your simulator. Yeah. The number of CPUs is something that you're specifying on the command line. So uh, right here, this is running with four CPUs and an S value of 3,200 microseconds. I mean thread, yes. And the CPUs that are in this system, so I'm going to scroll back up to this diagram. These are long running threads. So you're not making a new CPU for every task that gets loaded, but you're making five CPUs and they will just get tasks as there are tasks available. Then once it shuts down, then you shut down those five threads. Yes, yeah. If you want to cram it all into one file, that's fine. <laughs> uh, that's fine. If you want to break it up into several files, that's also fine. If you want to be nice to your graders, it makes more sense to load it into several files so that you don't have list stuff all over the place. But you don't you don't also necessarily have to spend a huge amount of time like hiding the implementation of your linked list from your scheduling policy. So that's MLFQ, that's the multi-level feedback queue. Uh, they all start at the top, and then as time goes by, you're pushing their priority down based on how much time they've spent in a queue. They all start at priority level one or, z or zero, whatever you want to call the top priority. And then as time goes by, as they're spending more time in that queue, they're getting pushed down. Yeah. Okay, all right. So it is 144. I'm just going to go straight here. I am going to say that what we're going to start working on tomorrow is probably spending time looking at file systems. I want to make sure that you're prepared for the lab next week. Uh, so I'm going to focus on file systems first because that's what you're going to be starting to work on for next week's lab is file system stuff. Uh, and then we will maybe loop back to the IO scheduling and IO stuff, but the file systems, we can do file systems without that stuff. So we'll go straight to file systems tomorrow. 
I otherwise hope that you have a good day and I'll see you all tomorrow. Bye everyone.